All right. Good morning, Ian. Hello, Alex. <laughs> good to How see you, you again. <laughs> I'm good. Thanks. Yeah. All right. So today we're going to go and talk about chapter five. But before that, I took a look at the comments on YouTube, which is something that some people advise not to do. But in our case, they're all kind of very <laughs> positive and supportive and thanking you for your great work. And some people are reading the master and his emissary other people are reading the matter with things and some are in on one of them in the in their path to another one and, and and generally it seems that they're enjoying that we're doing this now there's still I, i've started collecting some of these comments and we can talk about them when it's time according to the chapter we may be talking about in future occasions but let me just just try to summarize mention some points that maybe are worthwhile briefly discussing before we jump into the chapter okay yeah tell me one or two and we'll talk about them and as you say they're subjects that really would come up um, later in our discussions mm. but why not let's discuss them briefly now yeah all right so so i've seen a few comments if i'm not wrong already asking about consciousness, which comes much later, was it chapter 20 something, 25, I think. 25, yeah. And in that respect, um, somebody said, or were asked for a relationship between what you're saying, what we are talking about, and the work of Rupert Spira and Bernardo Castro. And um, probably coming back to our introduction, where we were discussing in what, what is our or your conception of the world, and of course, they're mentioning Spira and Castro because they're well-known idealists, if you could put it in this way. So I was thinking, well, we have more in common, um, more, more things in common and, and differences between them, but probably that, that comment was also asking for and amplifying which important differences may there be between their views um, and your views about the world out there, the role of mind, whether everything is mind, uh, and so on. Um, so I don't know what you have to, to say about it. It's, it we, we could devote a whole <laughs> conversation about that. Maybe we do in the future, but just for now, what do you think? Yes. Yes, well, um, I think there's, there's a, a, a point in common, obviously, between what I'm saying and what Rupert Spira and Bernardo Castro are saying. Um, and as you put it, we probably have more in common than not in that we both think that materialism is, uh, is simple and, and wrong. Um, but there is a difficulty about going so far in the other direction that it seems like reality is something purely in the mind. First of all, I don't believe that there is nothing except what's going on in my mind. I believe I am making contact with whatever else there is in the in the universe. But more importantly, there's a, a problem with the way in which this is conceived. I conceive experience as an encounter, that we know reality through an encounter. And there can be no encounter if either all reality is made up internally or all reality is simply out there externally. <laughs> The all important element, the most important part of this is the bit that gets left out, which is the encounter of something in my consciousness and something that's outside of my particular consciousness. Mm -hmm. And I, this is an overall problem I find with, um, and I come back to it so many times in this book, that we need to be able to maintain two of what the left hemisphere sets up as contraries. We need to be comfortable with holding them both and holding them at the same time. It's this that actually gives life to the situation and it helps us to achieve a true vision of reality. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I mean, my, my feeling is that I may have misunderstood or maybe re misrepresenting Rupert and, and Bernardo but it's this holding together of things. I'm constantly saying this, that we need, where there's a dipole, you can't just have one end of it without having the other. Mm. Um, you can't cut off one pole of a magnet. You, you, it will reinstate itself. If you cut off the end of a stick, it still has an end. There are these two elements 
And it's the tying of them together, what I call the betweenness, which includes both of them. And importantly, the new thing that comes about through their encounter. Yes. I mean, it, we agree again that we are fleeing from materialism. The question, well, maybe that's not the question, but a question could be then pick your ism. And I haven't picked my ism. I haven't, I mean, I know I'm Spanish, but I, know, I don't know if I'm a dual aspect monism, monist or an idealist or what flavor of idealist. And of course, you, you, you see what can happen is that if we would have a conversation with Bernardo or with Rupert, um, actually this happened with a conversation Rupert Spira had with Rupert Sheldrake, whose views may seem to be um, not opposed, but maybe not going in a point of confluence. And, and they were able to have a conversation where at the end, I think they understood they were much closer than what they anticipated. And they were close enough to begin with, but with, with a different, different, you know, sensibilities and also different practices. I mean, Bernardo's um, idealism, as I understand it, is it's analytical and it's kind of hardcore, hardcore intellectual. But then the, the one of Rupert Sp Spira is, is more, I think it's drawing more from the phenomenological tradition, um, not from the West, of course, from the East. But so in any case, I think you were saying before that we're not searching here for division of union and division, right? Um, so if you can that's say it, something more it. about that, that's that's very interesting. And maybe that's a point of agreement. And again, agreement is overrated. We don't need here to all agree on these points. I think it's interesting to you know, see this problem yeah. with, with similar sensibilities, but maybe differences in it. Yes, well, the first thing to say is I suspect that any conversation that I had with Bernardo or Rupert would show that we are closer together than maybe people think. Mm. Um, so I agree with that. But there is this, I, I haven't started so far talking about this because we're looking at the neuroscience at the moment. But when we come to the second and third parts of the book, I'm constantly emphasizing the need for two apparent contraries, for the need for division and union, but for them to be unified, not mm -hmm. divided. So mm -hmm. at a higher level, the union trumps the division. Equally, we need to be able to respect and not sort of do away with either of matter or consciousness, but they need to be held together and out of the richness of their confluence comes something special. Mm -hmm. I mean, we'll talk about that much more when we come on to chapter 25, I know. <laughs> but, but it's this shape, you see. Um, it, you know, I'm constantly emphasizing that we need the asymmetry of symmetry and asymmetry. Mm. They're not symmetrical, but mm. they're both needed. Mm. And I sometimes say we don't need uh, either or, or both and, we need both either or and both and. Mm. So we need the dividing element and the unifying element together. Mm. I think that somehow to me uh, points up one of the possible differences that we have that it's so easy to collapse an uncomfortable dipole. The left hemisphere doesn't like this uncomfortable ambivalence. It wants it clear. And indeed, it wants a category. So it wants you to be a dual aspect monist or whatever. Mm. I'm slightly suspicious of these terms. Rather than start off <laughs> with, as it were, a number of uh, boxes and say, choose one of these and jump into it. I'd mm. rather say, let's not worry about the boxes at all. Let's start from experience, from thinking, from reading, from living, and mm. see where that leads us. Mm. Afterwards, you can attach a label to it if you want. I'm not fussed about the labels. Yes. Well, and we'll come to this many, many times, I suspect. And yes, when we talk about consciousness and matter, that be at the core of it all the time. Um, and probably we touch on Whitehead, because much of what you're saying reminds me of Whitehead, also even, even the idea of a dipole, because it's not just a, a, a physical illustration, but I think he uses he uses that to kind of to kind of hold a dualism, which is of um, it's a dualism not as is usually understood, which is, sounds like something you would want to avoid at all possible costs. Or like my my love beloved Henry Bergson, who's also in a way a dualist, but it's a dualist that it's trying to transcend dualism, right? And and I, I recognize that it comes from your, depending on your background, what you study, your sensibility. 
you 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 have you may have your favorite highway or or road to get to to get through not to get to a place to get through this landscape which is what you're saying like this encounter with reality um but that sounds too abstract but well i think it may perhaps unless you want to add something more um that that's good enough to choose as a as an invitation for more <laughs> <laughs> yes i mean when uh, it's not quite the same but when people um talk about non-duality mm. um i i i'm i'm happy with that up to a point but what i think mustn't be lost is the non-duality of duality and non-duality mm. we can mm. hold those as as wholly alien to one another yes so it's it's out of this difficult um holding together everything is in this holding together of opposites mm. Mm. and i have a whole chapter as you know uh, at the beginning of part two on the coincidence of of opposites mm. um, and, and the tendency in intellectual discourse particularly in the west is to try and resolve attention and say well it must be this or it must be that my categories are, are, are crying out for you to jump into one or the other mm. but i'm also saying hang on i don't think your categories are, are that important actually Mm. They, they're just a left hemisphere tool for trying to get hold of what people are saying. Fascinating. Very good, Ian. <laughs> Let me move to another comment because otherwise we'll mm. be talking about this um, much longer than needed today. So, well, there are other mentions to other scholars like Eric Newman, um, mm. st student of Jung, I understand, and about consciousness again, your take on it and the relationship of your work to to his views on consciousness and also Nassim Taleb is mentioned. I don't recall now exactly in what respect, but um, well, some of the comments are trying to relate perhaps what they know, what they appreciate, what they understand with what you're doing. Also with respect to Eastern philosophies, of course, uh, it sounds, yeah. yes, your work is, is properly Western, but it sounds very Eastern. So it's, it's, it's an integrity in that way too, I would say. Yes, building on what I said before, what I like is to be able to see commonalities between East and West, rather than set them up as opposing one another. Mm. And there are strong traditions in the West. Um, they've been mainly sidelined. In fact, the very first words of uh, the matter with things refer to the fact that in the West, there have been voices that would be much more um, comprehensible in an Eastern tradition that have mm. been dismissed or sidelined, but they're there. And when we come to talk right at the end of this process about the sense of the sacred, uh, you will see that I, I am enormously, um, you know, uh, in agreement with, and to some extent dependent on various Eastern tradition, Buddhism, particularly Zen, Taoism, and so forth. But these uh, ideas are not confined only to the East. They're, mm. they're also in the Western mystical tradition, yes. about which people know far too little these days. Yes, exactly. As far as Jung and Taleb go, I suppose that um, just very briefly, I mean, there's a, a good deal in common between what I'm talking about and the Jungian ideas of archetypes of symbols and so forth, which are not just mechanical in their nature, but uh, are ontologically able to to bring whatever it is they symbolize together with something that is real it's actually quite relevant to what we're going to be talking about when we move on to talking about chapter chapter five as far as taleb goes i think probably the main parallel is and i very much enjoy and admire taleb's writing um one simple point or, or perhaps not so simple is his ant idea of anti-fragility um, in in the, what that shows is that things that look uh, from the local perspective as though they could be weaknesses or imperfections mm -hmm. are in fact part of the secret of the strength uh, and the success and the continuing becoming and ongoing being of whatever it might be. Yes, okay. And then we have um, some other comments about meditation and the relationship between both hemispheres and maybe whether they're synchronized what's what's special about the relationship between the hemispheres during meditation and then there's another comment about addiction medicine um well again i'm just randomly kind of well not randomly yeah. but just um 
telling you what I what I found there that people are interested. Of course, they're coming from their 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 interests and their point of view, and maybe they're expecting these things to appear. As we're talking about uh, attention, for instance, they this is reminded because th that's probably what they're concerned with at the moment. Yes. Well, you know, maybe when we get on to um, the, the, the 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 metaphysics that is the subject of part three of the book, we may have to have longer or even repeated explorations because these these subjects are vast. Mm. I mean, one of the things that I, I remember you mentioning to me was that you saw that people were saying, well, we've heard a lot about the right hemisphere and how important it is and what happens when it's deficient. But what about the left hemisphere? Yeah. Well, today is the day for hearing about the left hemisphere. <laughs> yes, it's a timely one. It's a timely comment. Enough about the right hemisphere for a moment, and let's see what what can go wrong, or what happens. Mm. Yes, so that's yes. the topic indeed of your chapter number five, that's entitled yes. apprehension, and it's brief. <laughs> it's ten pages long, approximately, uh, comparing it to um, previous ones, which are about fifty pages long, easily, and other coming chapters, like again twenty five of, of matter and consciousness, which is like about a hundred, maybe a bit less. <laughs> you, you could make little books out of it. So in your book, there are many books, but this one is just 10 pages, but that doesn't mean it's, it's less interesting or less important. So let's jump into it. <laughs> okay. Well, in fact, it, it, what's quite nice about it, and it's hard to do in a conversation like this because it would involve reading them out, but there's a lot of vignettes of patients and what happens to patients mm -hmm. with left hemisphere damage and i think it's absolutely fascinating mm -hmm. it's just it's it makes the thing come alive and it's hard as i say to do that in a discussion like this but i suppose if i were to stand back a bit and take an overview of it i i'd say there are um, perhaps two main things i want to be able to deal with in talking about what happens when the left hemisphere is deficient. One is to do with utilization and the other is to do with representation. So let's try and um, use those as way markers in our discussion. And um, you mentioned uh, the title apprehension and I, I understand of course that the word apprehension can be used in many ways in English, but I'm making a distinction between apprehension and comprehension. And it's supported by the etymology of the terms in that apprehension means holding on to something, grasping it and getting it and holding it. Whereas comprehension has more the idea of holding something together. And it's in that coming together, again, the encounter and the ability to hold disparate elements together in the mind, which is the 40 of the, of the right hemisphere. Um, that understanding takes place. So I'm contrasting the left hemisphere gives us apprehension, the right hemisphere, as we've explored before, and as we will continue exploring, gives us comprehension. Yes, and very, and very soon we get also concrete, which is something I appreciate in this chapter, because you're going to talk about the control of the, of the, of the hand and the arm. Um, and also about speech and language. So these are going to be like the two main kind of streams of data. Uh, but at the same time, what you're going to be talking about very concrete things of our everyday life. So uh, I, I like when this happens, when we're talking about something that's conceptually deep, but it's, it goes all the way to something like using your keys or inabilities that patients may have, just, you know, shaving themselves or, or using a hammer. And there's another thing, that will unfold from this chapter, which is subtle differences between between, between words and concepts, like that the idea that mm. utilization, or uh, as you were saying a moment ago, um, holding on to the world, it's not holding together. And also the difference between moving the hand per se, which would sound like a very much like a control motor control problem, and then more cognitive aspects like grasping, like and, and maybe mm. we can go through some of these examples, like also when you when you talk about you talk about left hemisphere damage, but also right, and then you contrast like problems again using the keys versus problems making a cup of coffee. I found that fascinating because one has to do more with means, the means to get to ends, and the other one has to do with with the whole process. And again, there seems to be they seem to be differentially 
expressed or controlled by the hemispheres. Yes, I mean, you touched off there a whole range of, of ideas that are important and we must try to try to explore. Um, I think it, 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 what's clear is that when there is damage to the left hemisphere, the world is still there and the world is still comprehensible. Mm -hmm. But what the per person, the sufferer has to deal with is the fact that they no longer find it easy to utilize mm. the world or to represent the world. Those are the two areas, I think. And what you're referring to about the keys and things is, yes, there is a problem when people have left hemisphere damage that they often find it very difficult to utilize simple daily objects like a toothbrush or um, a box of matches or something of the kind. And you mentioned making a cup of coffee or wrapping a present as ideas that are um, nonetheless still uh, understandable best by using the right hemisphere. So where there's a sequence of actions that together go to make something happen, then that is more the right hemisphere's look. But it's the isolated business of striking the match, working the scissors, or whatever it might be that goes when there is um, less left hemisphere dysfunction. And in a, a, a French physician, uh, early 20th century physician called Mola, in fact, called one of the syndromes that occurs with left hemisphere uh, deficits, uh, l'agnosie, l'agnosie d'utilisation, uh, an agnosia of utilisation of the world. There's this lovely description by Arnold Pick, who's a great Czech um, neurologist, of a patient with a left hemisphere deficit who is asked to um, light a pipe and this is in a way rather like making a cup of coffee. So he starts off fine, he gets out his pouch, he gets out the pipe, he stuffs the pipe, he brings it to his mouth, and then he has to strike a match. And he knows the whole sequence, but this utilization of the box of matches fails. And at the end, he takes out the match, looks at it, and sticks it in the end of the pipe, because he has no, no idea of what he's supposed to do at this point. I think she, uh, Mola also describes a woman who is given a pair of scissors and asks what they are. She says they're scissors and she understands the concept of them perfectly well. But then she starts trying to write. They ask her to write something and she tries to write with the point of the scissors and seems completely amazed that no, no writing is appearing on the paper. So it's at this last fence of the simple act of utilisation that things start to be um, difficult for somebody who hasn't got fully functioning left hemisphere. I should mention that when you're uh, learning neurology, you learn a heck of a lot about um, left hemisphere syndromes. It's a point that's made by Oliver Sacks that, you know, neurology is terrifically left hemisphere chauvinistic. <laughs> it's as though only things that happen with the left hemisphere really matter. And there are, you, there are a range of things like finding it difficult to write, um, difficult to calculate um, and so on. And these are usually things which require a process of representation of reality, because remember, those are the two elements in which the left hemisphere, by which you could characterize the left hemisphere most uh, essentially and most characteristically, the business of utilizing and representing. Mm. So I'm, I'm still trying to understand better this subtle difference between movement of the hand and its use um, to deal with objects. Um, so is it that in, in, in the aim of grasping something, well, no, grasping would be incorrect because later on you, you, you talk that you, you explain that grasping has to do with more, ex, more with exploration of the world. Let's say seizing would be no. a better word. No. Sorry? No, I got not it wrong. really. Mm. No, um, no, I think um, the contrast is between grasping and exploring. Mm. And so when somebody has a stroke that uh, causes disinhibition of the right hand, so there isn't the normal suppressive control over the right hand, the right hand starts grasping completely without any purpose. So somebody is walking along and suddenly has to get hold of a doorknob. Mm. Um, 
uh, if somebody sees a pencil picks it up and has to start writing so it, the, the, this grasping of something in order to use it goes on when the right hand the left hemisphere's tool is disinhibited that's by contrast with what happens when the left hand is disinhibited because the left hand the right hemisphere's tool is not there so much to grasp as to explore reality mm -hmm. so there's a nice illustration uh, a case of a man after a left hemisphere stroke who is asked to explore a picture and uh, describe and point to what is there and he can do that with the left hand but the right hand comes in and tries to pick the thing out of the picture it, it's so taken with the idea of grasping that it has a completely different attitude to what it's looking at yeah that's that's uh, again i'm still trying to get around what's really going on so that um the movement of a hand which you could study very well depending on whether the aim of that movement is to grasp something or to explore um would be carried out yes. i mean it, it it's something that sounds very simple but uh i'm going over and over again because it it's simply fascinating that that's what's going on um there's a nice side, side light on it which is that the great apes our closest cousins in evolution um, already use their right hand to grasp something if they want to get it and take it but if they want to uh, make contact with another living being they use the left hand which is really extraordinary mm. um i mean obviously not in every single case but preponderantly statistically very significantly they use the, already they use the right hand for getting things and the left hand for making contact with another living being and perhaps i should say something about the the um business of language as a representation because that also involves the great apes one of the things that's extraordinary i may have mentioned at some point is that the great apes and by the great apes i mean uh, gorillas bonobos chimpanzees um and so forth already there is an expansion in the language area as it's called in human beings the left um posterior cortex and and um, medial cortex that uh that expansion is there but they can't use language. They have no language and attempts to teach language have largely failed. What is that there for, for doing for? Why is there this expansion already? And I think the answer to that is because although uh, the great apes don't have language in the sense that they can put words, sounds to um, a, a, an, an experience, they do have concepts. They, they've abstracted a concept and it's that that is the great step forward that causes this expansion, if you like, of the left hemisphere in what we call the language area. And, and the, to illustrate that it's not really just about language, um, I love uh, a couple of findings about people who um, have no ability to speak, who are deaf or dumb and cannot speak. And you'd think that, for example, um, lip reading given that you know the right hemisphere is very good at um, understanding the movements of faces and interpreting faces and the left hemisphere is not at all good at it you'd think that the right hemisphere was the one that served lip reading but it isn't actually it's the left hemisphere that serves the lip reading because what it's looking at there is representations mm -hmm. sounds or words or movements for a concept and taking that even further sign language which is after all a visuospatial thing, you think again, well, the great strength of the right hemisphere is this visuospatial ability. But in fact, sign language is interpreted by the same cortex that in a hearing person would be uh, understanding an utterance. So again, what I want to make the point is that the so-called auditory cortex is the key thing about it is not audition the key thing about it is representation mm -hmm. and it just happens that in us that is with words but it could be with signs visuospatial signs and that's and equally, why i think that 
I'd just like to say that, you know, I think one of the things that I would hold is that the visuospatial strengths of the right hemisphere are not so much merely about the modality, um, the, the visuospatial modality, but about the fact that for us, sight is the most dominant sense and the one with, with which we assure ourselves that something is real. And so it really lines up not auditory in the left, visuospatial in the right, but representation in the left and the actual presencing of reality in the right. That's why you, why you make this um, precision again when you start talking about language, uh, making it clear that you think that language is not necess necessary for communication. That's not that we don't use it for it. We, of course, use it nor for thinking. So you're going to place language more in the domain of mapping the world, right, rather than, than telling each other things about the world. And then you talk about this relationship between the real world and again, one would need to expand what we mean by real world out there and with quotes, but then the tokens of it and these different relationships and um, where the tokens could be, we could conceive of the tokens as inside the world. And there, there will be other things that are not tokens or the moment where you equate both of them. And, and that helps. So, so you put an example that's also somewhat puzzling, but also illuminating when you speak about, for instance, the word, the word sun, and, and some studies and that, that where people say, well, the, the, well, sun me it's it's called like that because it shines, and and so so it's a difference between how these tokens yes. are assigned to words and are assigned to mapping mappings of the world. Yes, it's a very important difference, in that it seems to me there's a really crucial point here that the left hemisphere somehow doesn't make the bridge across from its world of representation to the real presence. It's, it tends to um, self-referential circuitry. So we get ideas, incidentally, which we may come on to much, much later. Um, a, a popular idea now is that actually all the things we think from our senses, we are contacting reality, we're not. We are shut off in mm. a windowless padded cell somewhere inside the, the, the head. This is a typical left hemisphere misunderstanding of what's going If you ask the left hemisphere to try and understand what it's experiencing, it will say, oh, it's something I made up inside me. It, it, it's not really out there. And the same thing is, um, happens with language. So in the last hundred years with de Saussure and so on, it became a kind of um, uh, a, a, a dogma that language just refers to itself, that these are self-referential symbols. It's just a system of symbols referring to one another. Mm -hmm. But importantly, although they can refer to one another, they also refer outside the system to reality. And what you what you were describing is a very lovely experiment in which people had one hemisphere, these are normal subjects, had one hemisphere at a time knocked out. And then they were asked whether or not the word for the sun is just a, a random or accidental uh, sign. And with the right hemisphere, as you say, they said, no, the sun is called the sun because it shines. Um, bread is called bread because it's so tasty and fresh. Mm -hmm. um, spaghetti is called spaghetti because you eat it with cheese. So <laughs> in a way, what they're saying is, no, this word belongs to the world of actual experience. So the words have been taken by the right hemisphere to have more reality than we would normally accord to them. But when they have the right hemisphere suppressed, the same subjects answer about the words that they're entirely random. Mm -hmm. You know, you could call it anything um, and it wouldn't matter. Now that's actually not true either, because it, although, as, as I say, people used to believe that um, there was no uh, experiential grounds to the words that we choose to represent experience we know that this is not true that you know there's something called the kiki booba effect which means that if you have a, an invented language and you tell people that um there are two words kiki and booba and you show them a picture of a 
spiky, pointy object and a nice round, smooth one. They always say Kiki is the pointy one, Booba is the soft, mm. round one. And in mm. fact, you find these uh, elements are characteristic of languages. <laughs> And then you go on and move and talk about the elements of language. I'd also like to um, discuss this and ask you about that, because on the one hand, you place metaphor. And that's interesting because we scientists use metaphors all the time. But again, we pretend often that we are not using metaphors unless we're kind of confronted with it. Uh, then there's the role of pr prosody, prosody as the second element. Um, which to me also has um, resonances with Eastern traditions and the idea that that how the word is uttered, the sound of it, like for instance, reading poetry should be read aloud. And even what we write, even if it's prose, should be read aloud. Like that there's something carried out in the actual utterance that's very important. And the third element you mentioned is pragmatics, which also you could, you could unpack a bit, but it's this idea of context. And these you oppose to syntax and semantics, which is, which is what we would love to do. I mean, computationally, one would, even studying animal behavior, I've done it myself. Here you have a sequence of actions, and then you try to find the rules that, that hold them together in terms of grammar. Semantics is a bit harder, but we also hear that it's just semantics um, <laughs> and conversation stopper. But these other three uh, elements I was mentioning before are always there, but are harder just to pin down, right? Because they, they have this, um, yes. this yes. right hemisphere um, relationship with the lived world, a concrete experience, and the body. Yes, well, um, as in The Master and His Hemisphere, uh, in chapter three of that book, I, I look at the various theories about the origins of language and uh, I myself uh, am persuaded by those who believe that it's an evolution from, if you like, music, not music in the way we understand it now, but of inflected sounds which didn't actually have um, words attached to them, but nonetheless expressed uh, meaning and feeling. And, and I suggest there that actually we only need referential language of the kind we now have when either social groups become bigger than a certain size um, and you, you need to be talking about something that's not present to the, the speakers at the time. Um, something that you have designs on outside of the context of your immediate communication, then you need language of the kind we have. So you're right, the, th the three uh, elements that the right hemisphere above all um, is able to support are um, pragmatics, which is the understanding of an utterance in context, understanding what this particular phrase or sentence means, given the, sen the context in which it's uttered. Um, the business of prosody, which is the inflection of the voice uh, and the meaning that's conveyed in how it is done, and the business of metaphor, as you say, which I think we may have discussed uh, on a previous occasion, but if we haven't, we certainly will in the future, I promise. <laughs> but uh, semantics and syntax are elements that the right hemisphere also has, but they're stronger in the left hemisphere, whereas the, the elements that I've just described, metaphor, prosody and pragmatics, are more or less a closed book, if you like to, to use that metaphor, um, for the left hemisphere. Do you think we should talk about one or two syndromes that do occur after left hemisphere damage? Because I think they're quite useful and interesting. Um, from my um, research into all the main um, uh, um, described clinical syndromes following left or right hemisphere stroke, the most striking one that allies itself with damage to the left hemisphere is called autotopagnosia. And this is a condition in which people find it hard when asked directly to name a body part, or they're given a name and they have to point to it. What you need to remember is that the left hemisphere doesn't have an image of the body as a whole. Instead, it has body parts. And so what happens when the right hemisphere is defective is that the body stands out as a collection of parts rather than as um, a, 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 a single whole. That's, I think, uh, an interesting one. And there's another one called Gerstmann syndrome um, well, the first thing about Gerstmann syndrome is it's been very strongly argued that it probably doesn't exist. 
yeah. and it's nothing more than a conglomeration of findings that are quite explicable. One of them, one of the four constituents of Gerstmann syndrome is finger agnosia, which is not being able to name a finger, which is really part of autotope agnosia that I've described. Um, another two, uh, dysgraphia, um, which is the inability to write, and dyscalculia, which is difficulty in carrying out a calculation, which, as you know, is a procedural element using specific symbols, uh, rather like language. In fact, when we're calculating, we are also rehearsing our what in English we call our times tables, the, um, the mathematical rules for multiplying. And, and so all three of those are expected to be part of the syndrome. The last one is right-left disorientation. Well, uh, a quarter of all normal human beings are right-left disorientated. <laughs> so it's a very, very common feature, so common that it can hardly be said to form part of a pathological syndrome. Mm -hmm. and in as much as it's been noticed, it's probably because of a difficulty in naming again. So what happens is this naming problem is the problem for the left hemisphere. But I want to emphasize, sorry, this is the problem when the right hemisphere is, is not functioning. But what I want to emphasize is that the reality referred to by the names or the words is still there. And we know this from extraordinary cases where people after a, a, a left hemisphere stroke are asked to try to read a sentence. And so there's a case I describe of a woman who's reading and the word says India and she says elephant. Mm. And the word in another sentence says Reichstag and she says Berlin. And she carries on describing the Reichstag in Berlin, but she can't find the word, even though it's on the page. So she has kind of like a blindness for the word, but the concept has sunk in at some deeper level and she knows what it is. Mm. And, and she's also asked to read the name of Goethe, you know, the greatest poet in the German language. And she goes, oh, uh, it's, a, it's a poet, um, it's Uhland. Uhland was a rather negligible, <laughs> Um, uh, slightly later poet, um, but she doesn't seem to be able to get Goethe. And then she reads out G-A-L, which by the way is not of course how you spell Goethe, G-A-L, and then she suddenly goes, it's Goethe! Mm. And she's, so she knew inside what she was trying mm. to reach. The mm. reality was still there. This is the point I want to make, is reality is unaltered effectively mm. when damage is to the um, left hemisphere. but damage the right hemisphere always causes alterations in reality. Yeah, it reminds me of that common experience where something is at the tip of your tongue, so the, it's still there, but you cannot utilize it, you cannot say it, right? So that also illustrates this, this distinction between the world still being there, but it's just that you cannot use it for a purpose that's still there, which is in a way the summary of that chapter, right? Like that, that left hemisphere dysfunction doesn't radically alter the world. Um, now, taking that, I would like to put it upside down and say, isn't it a sad irony that um, in order to utilize the world, it seems that we kind of lose it, right? There will be like, the, the, so on, on the one hand, yes. left, okay, let me say it again, like, like left, left hemisphere dysfunction would tell us that it's still there, it's just that we cannot use it. But then the contrary seems like, well, the moment we engage in using it, it can happen that we start losing it. And that's, that's when we, rather than experiencing the world, we start living, quote unquote, in these virtual worlds that are not, again, the world um, with, <laughs> with quotations. So th there's, a strange, there's a strange dynamics that, of something that goes upside down the moment we want to do things in the world, which is something that, of course, we should not criticize because that's all about being alive. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think one would have to um, qualify doing because the right hemisphere is as involved as the left hemisphere. Both are obviously involved in almost all motor actions, of course. But you're right in the sense that the, the, the left hemisphere's task seems at this point in evolution no longer be to help us understand reality, but to help us 
become powerful. And there are two ways in which we can become powerful that would interfere with the ordinary business of getting on with living if they were taking place too close to that business of experiencing the world and actually living in it that you describe. And those two things are to be able to grasp and use, which we can do better than any other animal by a factor of many orders of magnitude. And the other is to be able to create an, an abstract schema of it, which enables us to see an overview and to see what I need to do tactically is this rather than that. Now that, that faculty requires one to give up for the time being um, the world for the map. A map is as powerful as it is only because it, it leaves most of the world out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what has happened is that over evolution, the left hemisphere has become increasingly specialized, particularly recently in evolution, increasingly specialized in not keeping us in touch with and moving about in the world in the way that it, um, in, in, in the history of evolution has done, but it's been taken as a specialized unit, something like a computer. I, I always resist the notion that the brain is like a computer. It absolutely isn't, but that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is the relationship between the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere is rather like the relationship we have with a computer in that the computer doesn't know what we know, but it can carry out procedures that are mm. familiar and mm. routine and carry them out fast. And then we take the information back into the real world mm. with the right hemisphere. So the right hemisphere, it, it carries on being the mainstay in reality. But when it's damaged, the left hemisphere is completely at sea. It believes the most extraordinary things that nobody um, in their right mind would ever consider. And we've seen some of that and we'll probably see see more in, in the, the next few chapters. Yes. Interestingly, from a historical point of view, um, in the great apes, the left hemisphere, although it is certainly um, partly in service of concept making, is still more rooted in the real world and the perceptual world than it is in human beings. So you still find visuospatial skills in the left cortex in uh, the great apes, which is the homologous region in the left hemisphere to that in the right hemisphere, which still in us uh, subserves visuospatial functioning. And occasionally you meet human beings who, as it were, have this throwback evolutionarily that they still can do this perceptual thing in the left hemisphere. But for most of us, the, the perception of reality, the attention to reality, the judgments on reality, all the business of actually understanding the world has been sequestered to the right hemisphere while the left hemisphere does its map making. In ending, and I propose all that, let me ask you a rather speculative question and then maybe a kind of a really weird follow up. I'm, I'm, I'm letting you know in advance because there's a weird follow up question. The, the, the okay. speculative question would be in terms of evolution. Um, how do you think humans would be if there hadn't been that s split in terms of hemispheres? Because um, you, we've talked about it briefly. It's, it, it's at the very beginning of your book and probably also in the master and his emissary that it reached the point where a solution had to be made. And, and that's, that's the whole kind of structure and infrastructure of, of the hemispheres, the separation, inhibition, and so on. But, uh, and, and there, there are other animals that, that don't have split brains, right? But how would our world be today? What we, even what we would have done to the world had we had just one big hemisphere instead of two. Well, um, as you know, there are no animals that we know of that have a single homogeneous and symmetrical neural net. They always have an asymmetrical one, and that leads on very, very early in evolution to the ancestors of two neuronal masses, which we in us are the hemispheres. Um, but there are two separate questions, I suppose. One is what would have happened if that had never happened, which frankly is so impossible to speculate about that I don't know quite how to answer it. But the other question might be, 
Um, not what would happen if we didn't have two distinct hemispheres, but what would have happened if they had more redundancy, if, in other words, there was more overlap, what the left and the right hemisphere do was more similar one to the other. And I'd, I'm not sure which question in a way you were asking, but, but I can't really answer the first one because it's at the base of everything we know about living creatures that they have this kind of a division. But if, if there hadn't been the specialization, I suppose all I can say is that we would have spent longer at the point of evolution of the higher mammals, such as monkeys and the great apes who are, if you like, living exemplars of what happens when the two hemispheres are not so radically specialised. Please don't let any listener misunderstand what I'm saying. The hemispheres are specialised, they are different, just as ours are, but the specialisation and the difference isn't so radical as it is in the human case. Mm -hmm. Well, so you rephrased the question and improved it. <laughs> Thank you, because I was more referring to the, <laughs> to the first one. So here it comes, a kind of the, the really strange follow up. But uh, and it's going to sound stupid, and it probably is. But it also has some kind of theological kind of wild thoughts underneath. What if um, we could evolve three partitions, or we came across creatures from other planets that have three hemispheres and you know that may sound like uh, why four and five but you see talking about dualities and and mm. one single principle two principles but then there's also um, this whole idea of the trinitarian structure of reality so would a third one um help resolve bring something new and um, alleviate the <laughs> the the right hemisphere from or help conciliate better both of them what would a third element subserve here if that was i mean it's a, it's a thought experiment right yes yes of course um yes it's it's a it's a vast speculation so anything i say is is, <laughs> is with that caveat um i think there already is a third element in fact in two senses the first is to do with reality and the second is to do with the union of the two hemispheres so there is what the left hemisphere knows and contributes there is what the right hemisphere knows and contributes but very importantly there is a third element which is what the union of the two together are able to uh, achieve which is more than either of them can alone that's a very important point but to be a bit more concrete about the idea of a third hemisphere um this <laughs> has been put to me that um, how would we be able to decide between the veracity or the um, uh, 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 ability of the, each hemisphere to reflect whatever it is that is the reality outside of my head? How would we know which one was more successful? Would we have to have a third hemisphere to judge between them? Well, you know, as I say, why stop there? Let's have a fourth one that can judge whether the third one is onto something or not. And you're into a, 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 um, a kind of hall of mirrors, effectively, a, a, an infinite sequence of regression. But um, more importantly, it's wrong because it, its premise would be that, and this takes us back to where this episode started, its premise would have to be, the premise of the question of the questioner would have to be that reality is simply made up inside the head. In which case, of course, we would have nothing to test it against. And how could I judge between the, the version of one and the version of the other? But, and this is such an important point, so thank you for raising it. Um, this is not the case. We are using these two instruments or, or um, modalities of, of perception and attention to the world to access the reality that is not contained just inside my head. And it's through comparing what the left hemisphere makes of that reality and what the right hemisphere makes of that reality, that we can so clearly say that the right hemisphere has much greater, uh, its vision has much greater verisimilitude than that of the left. 
And part of it is what we're unwrapping in these episodes, and there'll be more to come. Quite how unhitched from moorings in any reality the left hemisphere becomes once it's cut free from the right hemisphere. It no longer has an anchor, it no longer has a compass, it no longer has any idea what it's seeing. Mm -hmm. And it creates a completely absurd world in which people are at danger, uh, and uh, a danger to themselves, a danger to others, and clearly very distressed by being out of touch with the reality, the everyday business of living. Mm -hmm. Whereas people with left hemisphere damage, although they find it difficult to talk about and represent that reality, and although they find it difficult to do the immediate manipulation of it using the right hand, the rest of it is still there. So that's why we know that the right hemisphere is more to be accorded um, credit than the left. And why that is important, ultimately, I've probably said this before, but I really want to say it again, because again, it's so important. We've actually surprisingly hit, hit on a lot of really rather important points in this episode. But the great thing here is, as we shall see when we move on to part two of the book, that the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere take different views of reality which underlie pretty much all the famous paradoxes that philosophers address. And I can show that one of the takes on reality is more characteristic of the left hemisphere and the other take is more characteristic of the right hemisphere. Now, until now, philosophers have just had to say, well, it looks according to one way of looking at it like this, but if you look at it another way, it looks mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But we can now say, no, this was the way you would expect the left hemisphere to make, a, make its version of reality. And this is the way the right hemisphere would conceive it. And we can prefer the right hemisphere's take. And you can actually demonstrate that very simply through something like the paradox of Achilles and the tortoise, in which Achilles, famously swift of foot, is challenged by the tortoise to a race. And the tortoise says, you, you will never be able to overtake me. In fact, you can never really reach me at all. And uh, Achilles says, well, yeah, right. <laughs> and he says, no, 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 the tortoise says, no, no, I'll have a bet with you. And the tortoise reasons correctly, according to itself, that Achilles gives the tortoise a good head start because he's a very generous character and he knows that he can easily beat this tortoise. So he gives him a big head start. And the tortoise knows that before Achilles can reach or overtake the tortoise, he's got to get to that place where the tortoise starts from. But by then the tortoise has moved on. So he then has to get to where the tortoise now is. But by the time he gets there, the tortoise has moved on. And you don't need me to point out that this is an infinite series and therefore this process is never ending and he will never actually reach the tortoise. Now although that seems according to a certain way of looking at the world which is characteristic in about four respects, we'll come on to that when we look at chapter 16, of the left hemisphere's view, although that seems to have some kind of argument going for it, we know in the real world that Achilles will overtake the tortoise in his second stride, so it, 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 it's clearly wrong. Uh, and, and that is where I, I think this view can help orientate us to what is going on in the world, which is, after all, the reason I wrote The Matter With Things. Who are we and what the world is? I'm glad that with my rather stupid questions, you can give us so so lucid comments and, make, and remaking these important points over and over again. And I can't wait to get to that too, and the paradoxes. And the idea that they can serve as pointers to go beyond this kind of enclosed system that cannot see beyond. But there's kind of, as you were saying it, I was imagining there's always a door, maybe like in Alice in Wonderland, there's always um, a glitch in the matrix that if we pay attention yeah. to points to um, kind of the solution to get out of this kind of closed loop, which maybe that's what paradoxes are doing. And maybe that's what we are trying to do by, by discussing your book. Yeah, oh gosh, thank you for saying, um, for bringing that up, because I, I know we need to stop, but it's- well, we I don't, we resist, don't. <laughs> can't resist commenting, because um, it's a very, very good point. Um, the left hemisphere creates these closed systems. In fact, one of the, of Zeno's paradoxes, Achilles and the tortoise is a, a, a paradox of Zeno, um, an early Greek uh, philosopher. But another one is um, the division, 
which shows that you can never reach the door of a room because first you've got to get halfway but before you can get halfway you've got to get to a quarter of the way and before you get to a quarter of the way you've got to get an eighth of the way so you are actually stuck inside a hermetic system this is so characteristic of how the left hemisphere misconstrues reality because we all know there is a door i can go and walk into it but at a completely different stellar mathematical level we have uh, in Cantorian mathematics and in Gerdelian mathematics and logic, the notion that no system can actually be complete in this way. These doors are never closed and there is always a way out of the hall of mirrors. That mm -hmm. is such an important image it, it, and it needs enormous expansion, which it will get as we go on through, um, particularly, I think, part three of the book. Fantastic. We're not... You're not stuck in that windowless padded cell. Yes, that escape, <laughs> a, a, a joyful escape. Yes, hopefully. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you very much, Ian. Oh, thank you. See you in a week's time. <laughs> See you soon. Yes. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Bye.